Welcome everybody to today's Glyconite webinar. Uh, my name is Warren Walkerchuk and I'm the Associate Scientific Director of Glyconite. And today we're uh, going to be having an industry session. Today's speaker is uh, Andrew McIsaac. And Andrew is the CEO of Applied Pharmaceutical Innovation. And uh, Applied Pharmaceutical Innovation uh, is housed here at the University of Alberta. And uh, over the past decade or so, Andrew has been successful in establishing uh, quite a few partnerships worth around $75 million between industry, academia, uh, government, and various donors. And uh, Andrew is currently the Assistant Dean for the Faculty of Pharmacy and uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences. And personally, I'm looking forward to uh, his presentation today because I think uh, API is the kind of, of organization that can really help academics uh, in the pursuit of commercialization, uh, especially if you happen to be centered around here, but I guess, Andrew, you're working all over the place. So uh, without any further ado, I will pass it over to Andrew for his presentation. Okay, so yes, as mentioned, I'm uh, an assistant dean in the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, and um, I'm not a, um, uh, a scientist by training. My, my background is in economics and uh, public sector management. And I think the, probably the best way to, to describe what API does uh, is to walk you through um, our uh, sort of philosophy behind what we do and, and how we came to be, as well as some of the um, uh, areas where we support and help innovators um, with their uh, translational challenges. So, uh, what is API? <clears throat> we are um, an institute that launched uh, over a period of uh, four and a half years, um, coming up with the big challenge of uh, how we take commercialization and how we um, uh, assist innovators within post-secondary institutions with moving forward to market. Um, there's a lot of supports available for folks who are doing uh, research that has commercial applications, um, but uh, some of the areas that we look to, to support are ones that aren't typically addressed. They're usually ones that uh, most of the um, translational infrastructure uh, sort of assumes that a company will come in and support the innovators at. Um, <clears throat> We produce uh, the ability and capacity for folks to do their medicinal chemistry, lead selection, pharmacodynamics, uh, kinetics, ADME studies, formulation, stability, synthesis, a whole laundry list of um, uh, pharmaceutical sciences that uh, are needed in commercial drug development. Um, <clears throat> the issue that we found and the way that we uh, looked at building this support within the ecosystem is um, sort of summed up uh, quite well by a little bit of a metaphor. Uh, and it sort of explains the thinking that has gone into um, a lot of the uh, translational programs uh, within, within Canada. Um, typically, we picture uh, the scientist who, you know, develops a um, a new treatment or potential cure through uh, something in their lab as, you know, the person who has all the answers, um, which I'm sure as many of you know, couldn't be further from the truth. Imagine you're an architect and you've got a great idea for an office tower. Um, you might be able to uh, come up with the rendering and the, you know, uh, basic drawings that get people excited about it, but you aren't a structural engineer, civil engineer, mechanical engineer, interior designers, all these other disciplines and trades um, that are needed to make that building a reality. So no matter how much you do uh, as an architect, you can't do all these other uh, areas. And as you move into translational work as a scientist, um, you know, immediately you start to come up against challenges that are outside of your um, uh, area of expertise uh, and you can't exactly become all of these other trades. And so that is the uh, sort of formulation that we that we looked at when we were creating API. Um, now, if we look at sort of the traditional um, incubators and uh, commercialization accelerators that exist within Canada, a lot of them 
are focused on providing the scientist or architect with business development, marketing, management, and legal. The thought is that, you know, if, if the scientists have some of this business expertise, um, the science will take care of itself and they'll be successful in raising investment. Um, but what they miss out on uh, in this metaphor is all of these other uh, disciplines, um, which, you know, typically for a, <clears throat> for someone who is looking to uh, develop a drug, as you know, uh, are, are critical and can't really be, be found easily through academic collaborations or, um, uh, you know, co-applications for grants, because a lot of this is um, work that needs to be done without, uh, without publishing at a quick speed um, and really is uh, a big barrier for a lot of companies to, uh, to get off the ground. So it's the translational team that, um, that API provides um, that addresses that, that big challenge. And we do it in a unique model that helps uh, groups scale and grow their, um, their companies here within Canada uh, as they look to, to go on that path towards commercialization. Um, so as I was saying, there's a lot of disciplines that support the, um, the development of a company. Uh, most folks, would you know fit the criteria of the innovators at this early stage um, you know with an initial discovery that you think you need to patent um, but if you look at the way that a traditional life sciences company is set up um, you know they, they've got their innovators but a lot of their scientific staff are that translational support that moves the innovation forward um, through commercialization as well as the business and legal uh, and marketing um, in Canada's life sciences ecosystem. Traditionally, we have a whole bunch of innovators uh, and then we have built a few um, translational supports um, around, the, around the country. We do have some accelerators, um, but we're really missing the, the vast majority of the expertise that need, is needed to move forward these innovations. Um, so what API does is we build a shared translational team um, to support innovators everywhere. Um, not in a um, so, sort of siloed fashion where, you know, we expect people to come to us with a problem and uh, we'll pump out a result and, you know, they'll go about in their day. Um, but what we do is we work um, with companies uh, to build the team that eventually either they can um, uh, hire off as they grow and gain, gain investment or um, can move to another um, uh, project if the project that the innovator brings uh, proves to be non-viable. So uh, basically what we do in aggregate is support a lot of people's um, commercialization at all different stages. Uh, so let's say we have a group of, you know, 20 uh, innovators. Uh, previously, they would have gone to uh, apply for grants for very much the same steps uh, as they move along through um, through the development of their drug or compound. Um, but we do uh, the same service for all 20 of them, uh, sort of in a pooled resource model, where as the, the projects are proven to be non-viable and the ones that are really showing the great promise uh, come along, um, there's the ability for them to parse out the folks that have been working with them at API uh, into their own companies as they get investment and grow. Um, so it's an ability for us to scale innovation here in uh, Canada. Um, and it's something that, that typically um, hasn't been, been done as much. Usually what happens with an innovator is they, um, they patent, uh, they go out and look for investment. Investment says, um, you know, come back to us when you've got a regulatory compliant proof of concept. Um, they'll look and see what that is. They'll realize it's outside of their subject domain and they'll figure out the, the fastest way for them to get it is to uh, go to a uh, contract research organization, usually in India or China. It's still gonna cost, you know, uh, three to $5 million to get to the point where they're attracting investment. Most companies don't get that initial investment uh, to even get that proof of concept. And the few that do haven't built any in-house capability. So when they do get uh, that larger scale investment, uh, what most likely happens is they are um, stuck with a scenario where, 
you know, they basically need to either be a virtual company and continue to use um, uh, international contract research organizations, or they move to Boston or San Diego, uh, where they can access that translational team uh, much more uh, effectively. So using our model, we've, we've helped turn this on its head by building and uh, sharing it, the infrastructure that's needed to do these regulatory compliance studies um, and work uh, to move companies towards um, their, uh, their eventual success on, on the market. Um, and we do it in two ways, both for innovators directly, but also for industry much more broadly. Um, and the reason for that is we're able to use projects for large pharma like Pfizer or um, uh, Takeda to subsidize the work that we do for startups and spinoffs. Uh, it also helps the companies because, you know, a, a postdoc who might be working on uh, their project um, would have just come off of a project for a large industry. And so they've gotten that expertise um, uh, and that experience uh, from working on a project team uh, with, with, a, with a true commercial giant. Um, so we formally launched about um, uh, two years ago out of the university. We originally were um, a um, early stage institute within the faculty of pharmacy, um, but we saw the value for this uh, much more broadly within Canada. Um, and, uh, and so we, we spun out as a federally incorporated not-for-profit. Uh, and since we've launched, we've attracted over large, uh, over 29 large uh, industry projects from um, doing pharmacokinetics in the cannabis industry uh, to uh, working with uh, small molecule companies on manufacturing their drugs under GMP for clinical trials, running clinical trials. Um, we've worked with companies in the States who are looking to get their drugs on the market in Canada. Um, Throughout the process, we've hired over 17 translational interns at the postdoctoral, graduate, and undergraduate level. Um, some of them have gone on to work for companies that we've incubated um, and supported, and others have gone on to, um, uh, to academic labs uh, to support uh, teams that have uh, been working on drug discovery projects. Um, throughout this process, we've supported eight um, academic-based uh, spin-off companies um, with translational teams and built a network that includes over 90 experts and labs and facilities throughout a lot of Alberta, uh, as well as a bit more broadly across Canada. We've been in discussions with Erie Corps and uh, Ed Mari about filling in some of the gaps that um, exist in the drug development pipeline uh, for their startups. Um, we sort of pick up where a lot of those uh, federally funded initiatives uh, leave off, which is the beginning of that regulatory compliant um, uh, clinical work and preclinical work. Um, so as we continue to grow, um, really what we're about is uh, building the capacity for us to get a lot of this work done in Canada. Um, it's a uh, environment that is rapidly changing because of COVID-19 as well. Uh, one of our most exciting projects at the moment is the manufacture of uh, Probothol and other drugs that are needed in hospitals. Um, there was a big change when it came to um, supply chains with COVID-19. Many pharmacists will know and tell you that there's always been drug shortages and they've continued to get worse um, uh, you know, on, a, on an annual basis. Um, over the past uh, little while. And something like COVID-19 has really drawn attention to that because um, you know, a typical shortage of drugs is just due to uh, the very lean supply chain that we currently have where the exact amount of a drug is manufactured um, and basically delivered to the areas where it's needed um, in a um, sort of on-demand uh, function. There's, there's very little stockpiling. Uh, and so when there's any disruption, um, all of a sudden we end up with, with uh, no drugs on hand to, to address conditions uh, for folks. And with COVID-19, um, one of the big drugs that previous to COVID-19 was already facing shortages is Propofol, which is used to um, uh, sedate someone. Uh, and with the ventilators, um, it's something that's come up in short supply in the States right now, only about 50% of prescriptions for that drug are being, uh, are being filled. 
um, because of shortages. And so one of the most exciting projects we've got on the go right now is developing North American uh, based manufacturing of the drug. It's something that uh, due to economics isn't normally produced in North America because it's not a big uh, money earner for uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, but with the capacity of our network, which includes a lot of post-secondary infrastructure that is uh, already covered, we're able to um, uh, to produce it at a, at, a, at a cost that approaches what you get coming out of India or China, uh, at least on the scale for the Canadian market. Um, because it is an injectable, um, the, uh, the volume of the active pharmaceutical ingredient is, is, pretty, is pretty low. So uh, with about um, one and a half tons, uh, you can supply the entire Canadian marketplace um, for, a, uh, for a full year. Um, so that's one of the really interesting projects that we've got on the go right now. Uh, the other piece is we're working to get funding in place to um, have a more um, uh, broad intake of startups and SMEs that are looking for um, that translational support. Right now we're doing it on an ad hoc basis where the postdocs that we have funded by industry projects um, basically have a specific percentage of their time allotted to working with SMEs and, uh, and startups, um, but hopefully we'll get in place um, the capacity to do much, much more in terms of that incubation and um, uh, you know, innovator support services. Uh, the, bi the big piece for us though is we will always continue to work with industry um, when it comes to um, our program because it ensures that the services that we're able to provide are um, at the level that um, that's really being used in the commercial market um, and is able to to really move people along um, at a pace that is different than academia. Uh, one of the ways that our that our projects work with the postdocs that we have on hand is they're not just supervised by a PI within the lab within the university. They're co-supervised by um, one of our staff who has experience working in an industry alongside a PI who has subject matter expertise within an academic lab. Um, so they get a little bit of the flavor of, of both sides uh, and the um, industry or academic projects that are involved get the expertise of, of academia at an industry compliant level. Um, when it comes to API more broadly, um, as I said, we're, we're still hosted in the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the U of A. Um, uh, and we've got uh, uh, footprint in Calgary as well as Lethbridge. Um, but our hope is to continue to expand this model out um, in its scalable form um, to bring on capacity to support folks uh, across, uh, across Canada when it comes to drug development. Because um, we have a lot of expertise that could be used. Um, in the um, translational aspect of, of drug development, but um, the mechanisms that we have in place at the moment uh, aren't really set up for that. So that's really what, what we're looking to, to do as a framework and a model for um, uh, supporting both innovators as well as industry that would otherwise be taking their projects and work to, um, to other countries. Um, so that's basically us in a, in a nutshell in terms, of our, in terms of our model and what we do. Um, I feel like it would be good to have uh, a big sort of open question period uh, in terms of, you know, how people can use our services, um, how we're able to support. And uh, the other piece that I didn't mention as much is we do serve as a uh, broker for uh, translational work for, for labs. So um, if there are folks that have something that has an industry application, um, we pull their expertise into our network and um, uh, look for potential um, industry clients um, for those services or supports uh, in a way that is typically not done within post-secondary institutions because usually um, what, a, what research service offices and other supports are set up for is attracting um, uh, you know, novel research, whereas, whereas what we do is much more applying um, something that's already been uh, developed or discovered uh, to a commercial problem. Um, so that's that's it from my end, uh, and then I guess maybe we can go into some uh, some questions. All right, thanks very much, Andrew. I have a couple of questions that I'd like to throw out. Uh, you mentioned you know having trainees within API. Um, how do people become trainees within the within your network, and 
how do they become affiliated with API? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are generally recruiting quite openly um, on a regular basis on our website, appliedpharma.ca. Uh, there's a portal for folks to submit their CVs and applications. Um, we tend to have um, uh, projects coming in on a week-to-week uh, -week basis that requires additional skills and uh, addition, additional subject matter expertise. Um, so we do have a, a pool of candidates who have who have submitted CVs that we that we do pull from um, when it comes to putting people on on projects. Um, we also do have uh, specific projects that come up um, from time to time where we'll, where we'll produce um, uh, advertisements and, and put them up as well in terms of uh, a very niche expertise that we need. We do use MyTax uh, for some of these projects. Uh, one of the big issues with MyTax though is, is uh, the time that it takes to get a MyTax grant in place sometimes doesn't work for an industry project. Um, typically a project ramp up time will look uh, at about a month at the most, um, whereas a MyTax application can sometimes take considerably longer than that to get in place and have uh, have the student in place. In some cases, we funded students um, before the MyTax was in place and then used a MyTax later on to reduce the, the, um, the cost burden on the company that's been working with us. Um, really, the model that's worked quite well for us um, is, as I said, having our, our industry staff working alongside the student to provide that, that industry uh, training capacity, but then embedding them within an academic lab. Um, so some cases we have fed uh, students that are already in academic labs and already in place and we simply move them from um, academic research onto an industry project. Um, so it really depends on the, on the case and the scenario. Um, I expect that within uh, this next year we'll probably be hiring somewhere around uh, 20 to 30 um, uh, trainees uh, throughout our various programs and, and projects. Uh, and it's everything from uh, folks working on, um, you know, uh, plant extracts uh, to um, synthetic chemistry to, um, uh, you know, ADME and uh, toxicology to uh, analyzing clinical trial data from around the world. Uh, there's a there's a huge, huge, huge. Um, a variety in terms of the work and there's also a variety in terms of the skill level needed. Um, some of the stuff is projects that um, really can be for a, um, a master's level uh, and then a lot of the other ones are ones that um, we'd really be looking for postdoctoral fellows and uh, research associates who have had um, a decent amount of experience and really just need that um, uh, industry application. Of, of what the of the skills that they already have uh, from working in in academia. So Andrew, maybe if I can just follow up a little bit, mention this range of of trainees that you have. Do you have sort of short term, medium term, and longer term projects that that people get involved in? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the interesting things, and one of the reasons that. Um, uh, that were a little bit more novel is many times there are industry projects that are short term um, that come in uh, that really alone uh, don't work to to bring a student into. It's something that a that an academic or uh, someone else might do off the side of their desk, um, you know, and then potentially bring in one of their students in a little bit. But because we work as a uh, consolidating body, we actually create a pipeline of work. So these small projects um, can hire postdocs or grad students on for, you know, one or two years at a time uh, working on them. Uh, the, sm the shorter term projects that we have are usually at, at most about four months long. Uh, so they tend to be um, uh, something where we, where we have an immediate um, uh, need for a specific expertise. Uh, generally, we do try to keep projects on a longer scale because it's it's better for giving people industry skills and experience to have something that's you know around one or two years. Um, but uh, you know, we we tend to uh, vary that considerably based on what the what the needs of our project is. And again, 
um, the ability of us to chain together projects to really have folks moving from uh, task to task rather than coming in for you know a, a short term. So there is a lot of in silico studies that are being used in industry. Uh, we actually have one right now that's um, coming up that would be a, a potential student project. We're still kind of scoping it out. Really anything that you would have in terms of computational capacity is is generally needed a lot of a lot of translational science has nothing to do with the wet lab or the clinic really it's it's data so yeah no there's there's probably about a good 30 percent of our projects are at various stages uh, on the computational side yes that's definitely something that we are able and interested to do um, as I mentioned before, sometimes we go and uh, utilize uh, HQPs who are uh, already on projects or in labs, uh, and we simply um, pull them into our network and uh, fund them or um, uh, pursue joint funding to, to address an industry project or need, or uh, to enable that innovator or lab to have additional capacity that um, they wouldn't normally. We've got an example of that with a project that um, happened in Lethbridge. There's a lab that does uh, excellent work um, in characterization. And uh, we worked with them to send some of their students to um, uh, the States to work with a lab there that uh, does uh, virology research and basically gave them skills that um, we're now advertising to some of our, our clients and hopefully get more projects into Lethbridge to uh, to use that capacity uh, of the first student who, who went through the program. We also have a very broad, and I didn't really touch on this, uh, scientific advisory board who come from the drug development industry that we've been working to potentially set up a mentorship program or pull them into some of those larger industry contracts that might not be as much of a direct commercial application, but are more exploratory. And we'll, we'll probably have something out about that in the next, uh, in the next few months in a program announcement depending on, depending on uh, how a pilot that we're doing with Takeda goes. Uh, and that one is actually one that is on um, bioinformatics. And uh, I think that we're working with biostatistics uh, PDF to, um, to get it off the ground. So as somebody who works in the, the biosimilar, biobetter space, is API currently working with companies that, that are doing things in, in that space, biologics? Um, so we've had a little bit of, uh, of interest in, in that space, not as much as the, the work that we're doing right now in, in, sm in the small molecule space, but there, is, there are projects on an ongoing basis. We have a group that is trying to get a project off the ground, um, working to do manufacturing of biosimilars. Um, there's actually three of them. There's it's a, there's a big wave of that right now, and I expect in the coming year for that to continue to grow as there's a lot of interest in repatriating supply chains to North America. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. I can't think of any current active projects we have uh, in terms of biosimilars except for clinical data that we're just looking at right now. But it is something that comes up quite often, uh, and as you know, it's one of the one of the most active spaces. Uh, globally anyways too but uh, yeah it's not something that um, that I have that I, an immediate wet lab projects come to line other than some clinical trial data that we're that we're sorting through for a couple of companies we have um, about uh, 10,000 square feet of space uh, that's within the faculty of pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences um, that is uh, non GMP that we use for uh, our general work, uh, as well as uh, a GMP facility that can do um, uh, synthesis and formulation uh, and manufacture up to um, phase two clinical trials. Uh, the clean room has um, a capacity that we can probably do two or three projects at once, uh, which has now actually come up to capacity. Um, right now, they're working on um, a small molecule drug development program that's going to be going to clinical trials in the States and in Europe, uh, as well as working on um, a uh, extracted plant product, natural health product that's in commercial development um, and eating materials for clinical trials as well. Um, and uh, uh, what we've been looking at 
um, over the past few months is actually building a larger manufacturing plant um, here within Edmonton, uh, which we would need to do to um, support our larger manufacture of things such as uh, as propofol. Um, the other issue that we're that we're looking to build out is um, a GLP facility that's that's more extensive. We do have um, a few labs that are at a GLP level. Um, for folks who aren't familiar with uh, with a lot of this, it really um, uh, a lot of the um, issues with making something GLP or GMP is is paperwork and controlling access and ensuring calibration and all these sorts of things, which doesn't work very well within an academic lab. Um, and so we've had to sort of parse out uh, which areas we we bring up to that level. Um, and we are um, uh, about a month away from, from building our, our larger facility, which will hopefully be um, within easy transit to the U of A so we can have our postdocs working in um, academic labs and then popping over to the to the GLP and GMP uh, facility to do uh, to do project work so we get a little bit more of an interplay between um, the academic context and the commercial context um, and they um, they get a little bit more tra training in something that's um, uh, that's a, a true dedicated uh, commercial site um, but in the meantime we still have uh, uh, our GMP facility on on campus on the it's in the third floor of the the Cates building um, <clears throat> which can which can handle uh, probably one or two more projects a year uh, otherwise it's at capacity but uh, it's uh, um, uh, generally able to do um, uh, synthesis formulation uh, of clinical trial uh, materials uh, no biological uh, capability for biologics and that's something that we that we're thinking about in a in a longer term um, commercial development uh, piece uh, when it comes to expanding capacity uh, we simply just haven't had um, projects in that area uh, to a to a large degree to um, uh, to require that we that we build it out um, because we are project responsive. We aren't funded by a large base grant. Um, all of our funding comes from our in industry projects. Um, so we've we, some things that have been on our wish list for a long time uh, are stuck waiting until we find a, a corporate partner who uh, is interested in that capacity, in which case we can use the project to fund um, uh, the implementation of it. Thank you very much for the information about API. Certainly very interesting to hear how that's developed and, and that you really do have this sort of different model of working, which is very amenable to helping you know, people in the academic sphere move towards translation, which of course is something that you know, many of us are very interested in. And thanks again, Andrew, for a very interesting, in, informative session on what API is all about and what you're, what you're currently uh, doing.